So on behalf of Melanie, Svetlana, myself and the rest of the organisation team, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the CSP4 Study Weekend 2022. I hope you all enjoyed this morning's lunchtime bites session, although I still think perhaps it should have been called the brunch time bites this year. And for that matter, I think we're probably taking liberties in calling it Study Weekend. But anyway, thank you for joining us for this, the second year in which the Study Weekend has been held as a virtual event. And I hope you're now ready for the scientific sessions we've got in store for you this afternoon. Obviously, our original plans for this to be a hybrid meeting have been thwarted by COVID. And with that in mind, I hope you're all in good health. <clears throat> it would have been nice to be able to meet in person, but actually in some ways going fully remote is a mixed blessing as it levels the playing field, meaning that our friends overseas will be able to participate in the same way as those who are planning to attend the meeting in person. Being a fixed time event, we can only do so much to make it accessible to international speakers and participants in different time zones, but we've made every effort to ensure inclusion wherever possible. Since there can be a tendency for virtual events to seem a bit impersonal, do feel free to bring a more human element to the meeting by switching on your camera for the questions, breaks and breakout sessions. Note that almost all of the Zoom sessions will be recorded and become available to watch at a later date. Throughout the meeting, we'll be using Zoom and Slack. <coughs> I'm sure everyone's very familiar with Zoom by now, but perhaps there are a number of you who have never used Slack before. Hopefully you will have already joined the CCP4 Slack workspace. It's a very intuitive platform and I encourage you to get used to it as it will be very useful for discussion and breakouts throughout the meeting. Links to Slack tutorials have been posted at the top of the general channel within the Slack workspace itself. But if you have any difficulties, then do get in touch with the technical team. Note also that there is a new website to be used during the meeting, which is not the CVENT site that you use for initial registration. The new website that you should be looking at is sw2022.co.uk. The link to this study weekend hub was sent to you in the joining instructions email from Karen yesterday, along with the link to the CSP4 Slack workspace. And if you're on Twitter, <coughs> then you can tag the event using hashtag CSP4SW. During the sessions, you're free to use the Zoom chat for general communication with everybody. But if you want to register questions to be asked at the end of the talk, then you should instead use the Zoom Q&A tab. Even better, write your question for the speaker in the sessions channel in Slack. The session chairs will be monitoring both the Zoom Q&A tab and the session Slack channel, and will select a few questions to read out live, time permitting. Indeed, please make sure to write your questions down. In order to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly, participants will not be invited to read their own questions out. So you can't use Zoom's raise hand feature in the hope of being handed the mic. Note that the Zoom chats are not persistent, whereas the Slack channels are. So you really should preferentially use Slack for questions, as well as for general text-based communication and discussion during the meeting. There are already a few channels for social activities in Slack, so do go and check them out. Each channel includes a preamble at the top. There you can also find out about the social groups that will be held on Zoom both this evening and tomorrow evening after the scientific sessions. Let us know if you want to set up more social, scientific or general interest focus group channels or activities during the meeting. We'll be very happy to accommodate where possible. Finally, the nearest fire escape is Dave to your left and down the stairs, Linda to your right and up the stairs, Stephen through the kitchen, and Laura down the hallway and right by the poodle. Anyway, back to the scientific program. This year, the topic is current trends in macromolecular model refinement and validation. We're fortunate to have a fantastic selection of speakers who will no doubt elucidate, educate and inspire. Due to adopting a virtual format, we have elected to have a larger number of shorter talks this year. No doubt this will present a challenge for the speakers, but thankfully it should be good for minimising our Zoom fatigue. This afternoon, we start by hearing about some of the practical considerations that should be acknowledged and contemplated when attempting to model and refine a structural model. We will then have a mid-afternoon keynote presented by Dale Tronwood, who will provide a general overview of the structural model refinement procedure, in which we will learn the necessity for restraints during refinement and how technologies have evolved over the past decades. We will then hear about how prior information is generated and used in a variety of contexts and suites from low to high resolution to facilitate the refinement of both common and novel compounds. In our evening keynote this evening, <coughs> Bernard Rupp will remind us of the 
necessity for model validation, which is an extremely challenging topic, one that we should be ever conscious of and no doubt will continue to struggle with in years to come. Tomorrow afternoon, after the morning's lunchtime bites, we shall hear about the implementation of modern refinement tools that are available from a variety of crystallographic software suites. We will hear about new novel forward thinking developments within the field and also about how different experimental and computational techniques can be leveraged alongside macromolecular crystallography in order to achieve a greater understanding of structural biology. In tomorrow's evening keynote, John Helliwell will invite us to reflect on what we are actually trying to do in computational and structural biology, whether our scientific activities really allow us to test hypotheses as intended, and how the design and recording of our workflows is important in ensuring accuracy and thus the validity of our final conclusions. On Friday, the final day of this year's study weekend, we shall acknowledge the fact that model building, refinement and validation are inherently related, being fundamental parts of the modeling process that iterate again and again as we approach the final structural model. After the diamond user meeting, we consider some of the tools available <coughs> for automated and manual model building and interactive refinement. After lunch, we consider the necessity for validation and the usefulness of the ongoing re-evaluation and remediation of existing structural models. Finally, we will hear about how bioinformatics can help us with model building and validation, how structural models are deposited to the protein data bank, and how cloud computing can be used in the context of crystallography. Well, first, we'll kick off the programme with a somewhat unconventional keynote presented by Kevin Curtin who has a message that is very relevant in modern scientific culture, and indeed in a virtual meeting such as this. <clears throat> Kevin will remind us that we should all think about how we conduct ourselves and reflect on how we treat others in a scientific setting. Acknowledging and accepting individual differences should help us to behave in a way that makes others feel more comfortable. And I encourage you to keep this in mind throughout your time at this, the 2022 iteration of the CSP4 Study Weekend. I hope you enjoy the meeting. And now I'll hand you over to the chairs of session one. Okay, um, thank you, Rob, for your introduction to the study weekend on a Wednesday. Um, so Kevin has our first speaker, is from the University of York in the York Structural Biology Lab, where he, and he obtained his PhD in, from York in 1992, and has been there ever since. Kevin has been contributing to the study weekend for over 20 years, as well as many other training events for CCP4. He's a developer working with Coot, as well as Clipper, Paraneer, Parrot, Buccaneer, Nautilus, and probably some other parts of CCP4 as well. Kevin has also contributed to climate science and is interested in science communication. So as Rob mentioned, Kevin is going to be speaking about diversity in science and how barriers can act to exclude some people from participating in science. And hopefully this talk is going to cover how this is having an impact within CCP4, but hopefully is relevant wider within science and society as well. So Kevin, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my slides. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me and for the introduction. Uh, I, I guess it's, it's a, a slightly unfamiliar format for all of us, uh, even with a year of experience. Um, I would like to be in uh, Nottingham again, uh, it, it's a, a, a very special event for me, uh, despite the fact that, that large scientific meetings, including this one, uh, have always been very uncomfortable for me. Now, I, I tend to get burnt out after a day and a half. And for most of my career, I've felt like an imposter. I see other people who, who will go to a meeting for a week or even two and, and engage with it and, and think that, that maybe they must be better at it than me. Um, but it's not until recently, and until I really recently really started understanding uh, my autism, that I understood that it's not the scientific context that was the problem, but the social one. 
So at a scientific meeting, I, I'm constantly trying to process, uh, to deduce the, the unwritten social rules of an unfamiliar situation and conform my behavior to those rules. And, and that's a huge intellectual effort. And I hadn't realized that, that for most of you, you don't even know that you're doing it because it is so natural to you. So that, that was a, a revelation for me. Um, and it kind of explains uh, why meetings were difficult. Uh, the, the, rule, the kind of rules I see are interesting. So I, I, I'm not very comfortable looking at faces for very long, so I see a lot of clothes. Uh, and, and just looking at, at these images, uh, what I see is, uh, one thing I see is that women wear a much larger range of fabrics than men, but also a larger range of colors and a larger range of patterns which is interesting. Uh, that must be a rule which is a constraint on male behavior because the, the, they're wearing less um, variation. So I guess that maybe that's a status thing. Maybe men are more concerned about status and therefore have to uh, conform more to, to norms of appearance. Uh, so I, I, there are all sorts of rules that I'm constantly trying to figure out. So this is an unusual talk. It's the first of its kind. So we kind of have a blank slate like this slide. Uh, there aren't really any um, norms on which to base what we do in this session. Uh, so instead, uh, maybe uh, given that we're all a bit in the dark, I'll ask you a question. And probably a question you haven't been asked in a scientific talk before. How are you feeling right now? Now, uh, I have no way of knowing uh, how you're feeling, um, and, and probably my guesses aren't going to be particularly good. Um, but what I've been trying to do is throw aside all the no normal social norms you might expect, the ideas and pictures you might have of what's going to happen. And if that's worked, then maybe I have given you a brief glimpse into the kind of social disorientation I experience all the time. And if that's the case, it might be a bit uncomfortable. So my follow-up question is, what if whenever you go to a scientific meeting or where, whenever you go into work, you feel uncomfortable? How could that shape your scientific career? We all have to make career decisions at various points, uh, sometimes where we go in science, sometimes even if we stay in science. And could how comfortable you feel contribute to some of those decisions? I don't know if any of you have seen uh, this movie. It's available on Netflix. It gave me the title for this talk. Um, and uh, you can also, if you're in the UK, the Royal Society of Chemistry will fund local viewings of it. And it, it documents the experiences of, of three women, uh, one black woman, working in science over the past decades. Uh, and uh, it also features uh, the name of one of the most famous figures in British crystallography. Uh, so uh, I recognize, I, I rec recommend that you try and see this film, although content warnings apply, as you might imagine. And some of the uh, content of this film has to do with feeling comfortable or or the way people are made to feel uncomfortable or worse. So here is one of the, the uh, images from the film and it concerns a lot of behaviors which can be uh, in some cases intentional, uh, in some cases not, uh, often in some way targeted at different groups of people. Uh, what I'm interested in at the moment is, is um, behaviors and, and social factors which are less targeted, not at all targeted indeed, and, and not intentional, but still have exclusive um, uh, effects. Let me show you an illustration. So uh, suppose I do a Google search. How do I open a PDB file in Python? And we, we ask Google and it takes us to Stack Exchange. Uh, if you've done any work in computing, you will have been to Stack Exchange hundreds of times in the past. Uh, now, if Stack Exchange prides itself on providing the best 
uh, answers to questions and the best questions. And it has a kind of peer review method by which questions and answers are critiqued. Um, uh, and they also do a survey uh, from uh, time to time. Uh, here are some results from their 2018 survey. They asked developers what they would change about Stack Overflow. And for the first time, they broke down the results by uh, contributors uh, declared gender. And uh, Sean Brook, a social, social scientist working in this area, uh, has picked out some of, of the most common words from those replies. And, and men were using words like official, complex, and algorithm. And women you were using words like condescending, rude, and assholes, which is interesting, uh, given that the, the site is, is largely anonymous. People use pseudonyms. Um, so it's probably not a targeted of, uh, behavior. It's something fundamental about the social norms of the site. And if I go and read it, I see uh, at one level, people are trying to uh, uh, ask participants to create better questions and answers. But at the same time, there is another level going on where everyone is constantly being um, uh, rated that there, 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 there is a, 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 a social hierarchy dependent on how you conform to the culture of the site. So I think this, this uh, makes um, uh, links up with the work of, of psychologist Eleanor McCoby uh, back in the 1980s and many others have, have shown similar results since that there are distinct gendered communication styles and that male communication is typified by higher levels of social dominance signaling. And that's kind of what I pick up from uh, uh, Stack Exchange. Uh, and Sean Brock has also noted that male communication styles tend to become dominant in anonymous mixed contexts. So this is, a, this is such an important site that it plays a role in shaping the culture and who participates in, in computing fields. And this has an impact for CCP4. So in organizing workshops, if, if the organizers take their eye off the ball for just a moment, they can end up with, with an all-male presenting team, uh, like this example. There are other examples. Uh, I'll give you one from my own experience. Uh, here's how I used to teach programming. I've been teaching programming to chemists for uh, about 20 years uh, now. And the way I first taught it was based on how I was taught programming. So we start from the building blocks, constants, variables, expressions, and assignment. And then we learn how to build those blocks into more complex structures, loops, conditions, functions, and classes. And after about four hours of, of, of my lectures, the best students uh, sometimes reach the point where they could replicate what they could already do more easily in a spreadsheet. So in terms of outcomes, that wasn't really very good. Only a few uh, students reached a high level of competency, and that subgroup also tended to be male biased. And at the time I explained this, following the norms of, at, at, of the time at, and the conventional explanations that programming must be an aptitude and was probably linked to learning style and that this explained why only a few people really um, uh, got hold of it. But um, unfortunately that was all completely wrong and it should have been obvious that it was wrong and I'll show you why I think it should have been obvious. So before a computer was a machine, a computer was a person, a computer was an occupation. So here are some computers from the 19th century. Uh, do you notice anything about them? Uh, here is the computer room from the US Treasury in the 1920s. Uh, again, you might notice some patterns, uh, particularly if you look at the clothes. Um, here, uh, they, when, when electronic computers were introduced, people who had, who had previously been computers uh, became computer programmers. Uh, here are some uh, programmers programming ENIAC. Uh, some uh, historical commentators have assumed that, that these weren't the programmers, that, that they were brought in for the purpose of, of the photo. But actually, we know their names. Uh, you may spot a pattern in, in their names. 
Uh, here are some computers in the picture top right from uh, NASA Langley. Uh, and again, some of them went on to be computer programmers. Uh, and this, uh, we, we don't program computers uh, using cables and switches anymore. Uh, we use uh, high level computer languages. Uh, this is Grace Hopper, who you would probably call the mother of modern programming languages. And this is a picture of my mother, uh, Margaret. When she started working at the Vauxhall, she joined uh, what was, by modern standards, a diverse programming team. Uh, by the time she left her second programming job at the Brush Locomotive Works, she was the only woman in that department. And if you look at the situation now, only 2% of the top contributors to the main Python code sharing site are women. Computing and computer programming are now perceived to be aptitudes associated with a very small, mostly male minority. And this is not supported by the history, as I've shown. Uh, it's not uh, supported by our experience with children, and it's not in, uh, supported by uh, other departments at York, for example. In psychology, everyone is a statistician and a programmer. They need to be because psychology has awful data and, and perhaps in some ways has become the queen of the data sciences for that reason. So how did this happen? Uh, we know some of the factors. Hiring policies changed. Uh, computer advertising was targeted as boys when home computers uh, became available. And there were changes in the status of the job and uh, therefore who it was done by. Um, there's, there's the pink collar phenomenon that you can look up. So what we have going on here is a variety of social interactions, some which have created this uh, situation and some of which maintain it. So uh, one of these is, is barriers to learning. Uh, the way in which I used to teach and many people used to teach programming made programming hard. It made it only accessible to a few. And then there were external social factors. Uh, society uh, served to convince a, a small number of people uh, fitting a particular stereotype that they could and should become programmers. And at the same time, it said to everyone else, no, this isn't for you. So the ones who, who had had that social boost had the motivation to overcome the barriers we were putting in the way to learning. And the outcome was that the, the people doing programming uh, became, well, continued to be very unrepresentative of, of the population as a whole. And that became a feedback mechanism which reinforces the stereotype. So what can we do about it? Well, we can reduce the barriers to participation, stop teaching programming in a way that makes programming hard. And the other one is to deconstruct the social stereotypes, the programming that people receive from society, which tells them whether they'll be able to do this or not. And the slides that I've been showing you uh, largely come from my programming course. I, I show these to students as an effort to deconstruct the stereotypes that they have come in with. But we also need to reduce the barriers to participation. So how do we do that? Well, one useful insight is that we can look at uh, different programming languages by the diversity of their contributors using code sharing websites. And the language with the best uh, diversity of uh, contributors is the R language. Uh, and this tends to be taught from a very different perspective, from a data science perspective. Uh, but there are also a lot of practices within the community that encourage diversity. But that may not fit chemistry. When we reviewed our chemistry teaching, uh, almost all the research groups wanted Python. So that meant we had to learn how R was being taught and teach Python in the same way. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here is the first program that the students uh, uh, work with. Uh, that they, they see it, uh, they, they type it in, and then we take it apart and find out what it does. And it's just four lines, three of them uh, that which do anything. And the first line reads in some data. 
The second does some summary statistics and the third plots a graph. So within three lines, they've now got something that's useful. And explaining this, uh, we only have to explain uh, function calls, uh, four different function calls, an assignment and a variable. Uh, but we can do that in about 15 minutes, 15 minutes to get somewhere useful, as opposed to four hours to get somewhere fairly useless. So then we, we uh, gather a load of files from our, our um, uh, student laboratory uh, compute server, um, where, where all the instruments deposit their data. So these are, uh, this is linking to what the students are doing in labs. And uh, we ask them to find out how to read those files and plot the data in them. And they're in slightly different form formats. So there's a little bit of effort required in that. Uh, next, we start to do some data analysis. So here we're doing a, a kinetics calculation, uh, calculating a first order reaction rate. We take logs and fit a straight line. Uh, again, they, they see uh, what a, an OLS regression table looks like. Um, and uh, we are linking directly to the kinetics course, which is running in parallel with this. So again, it's very concrete, but introduces more concepts. And finally, uh, at the very end of the course, I, I mention uh, conditions and loops. I, I, I'm not sure that's the right call. Maybe they should be left to later. But in this case, uh, we loop over a range of data sets and, and uh, deduce what the order of reaction is and calculate the reaction rate using the appropriate formula. And again, that's reproducing a problem that they've already solved by hand and can now do more easily by computer. So, programming isn't the only barrier to participation. I've been a Linux user for 25 years, but uh, when students see me using Linux, that shows, sends a message about who can do the kind of work that I do. And that's not the message I want to send. So now the students only see me using Windows, even if it's an emulation. Uh, some people are probably using Macs, you're probably sending a different message to your students, perhaps one involving socioeconomic status. Uh, Git is something that has become dominant in the computer science community. Maybe I haven't found the right route. I've never used Visual Studio, but it seems to me that the, the, the learning barrier to, to start using Git is much higher than any of the other systems we have used. Computer languages make a difference. A lot of my crystallography work has, has been in C++, and I, I think that's a problem. Uh, Python should be better, although we, we don't see that in uh, the uh, code repositories from the number of contributors. Uh, R is good, and, and Pandas gives us uh, the mechanisms to teach R, uh, Python in the way that R is taught. Uh, probably crystallography tools make a difference as well. Uh, if you're still learning uh, to use CCP4 through CCP4i, then that's probably creating greater barriers than are necessary. And CCP4i2 um, uh, should do a better job there. And CCP4 Cloud even better because it takes away the barrier of installation, especially once we, we can have Coot running in the browser, which will come eventually. So what can we do? I've already suggested ways in which we can reduce the barriers to participation, um, and also that we can deconstruct the social stereotypes around programming. Now that's not necessarily trivial. Uh, we can cause backfire effects. So there is one called uh, minority stress, which is a form of performance anxiety that you create in people when you identify them as part of a marginalized group. So I've tried to address that using techniques that we learned from dealing with climate science denial. Um, I don't know whether I've got it right yet. Uh, it's something we'll be trying to measure this year. Uh, but we should probably also be trying to deconstruct the social stereotypes around science as well. And there are a lot of these, and, and again, their influence can be subtle. So here's a, a poster from the year of crystallography uh, uh, of Nobel Prizes awarded to crystal, uh, crystallographers. Uh, there are some, some uh, interesting stories here. Uh, someone who rescued Jews from Nazi Germany, uh, but also someone who became 
a, 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 an outspoken racist. Uh, I only found a couple of eugenicists, which, given the history of science, was fewer than I expected, uh, but they're there. But of course, the most notable thing you'll see is, is that most of the faces here are white and male. And the Nobel Prize um, uh, and other prizes and awards have a social impact on the way science works. Um, <laughs> Almost all the discoveries that we see are based on huge teams of people, but things like prizes and keynotes uh, talks like this one focus attention on people who have got to the top uh, and, and draw attention away from, from the, the huge teams that, that on, on which their work was built. And so even a, the, a very small bias in, in each stage of career progression can lead to a very distorted uh, profile of people at the top. And, and that gets reinforced through the mechanism of prizes and, and, and uh, keynote talks. And it also marginalizes young voices who are most likely to see the structural biases that we have built into the system. So what else can we do? I, I, I have two more suggestions. Um, one is, is uh, use elite preserving activities such as keynote speeches and awards and presentations to deconstruct those elites. Uh, when, if you are asked to give a, a, a kind of presentation or take part in an activity that has this top heavy bias, use it to call out that bias, at least for a part of your content. And also, at, Everyone has an, an, an area of interest where you can find equality and diversity implications. And you can make that part of the research and you can start publishing in that area um, uh, uh, once you develop uh, the experience and the tools. So uh, I think that's all I want to say. Uh, I guess uh, now I'll, I'll take questions and discussion. Thank you for that very interesting and um, slightly unusual talk. Very informative. I don't think yet we've had any specific questions, but there were several comments saying that, yeah, several people that have engaged with the R ladies community and have a uh, phrase for it. Uh, it's it's uh, unparalleled in, in computing. Uh, that the, There is a group called Pi Ladies, but it doesn't have the same level of engagement. Um, R has, has done things in this area that no other language has done. So we, we have a question from um, Paola Salgado on the, the Q&A. And um, first off, she says, you know, absolutely brilliant talk, Kevin. Thank you. And um, she said a potentially controversial question regarding your suggestion of what software language or operating system to use when teaching. Um, if you're from a, a, at least perceived minority is using the less common ones, good or bad? Uh, if you're from a perceived minority is using a less common uh, operating system, good or bad. Um, so that's a kind of intersection question, although though a rather unusual one. Uh, the I, I'm not sure. I, I I could even guess what the impact of uh, of that would be. Sorry. I, I guess maybe if if there's a a really obscure operating system or or. Um, uh, coding language, maybe that levels the playing field if nobody yes. knows anything about it. Uh, it. But if you're using something unusual, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's kind of um, a, a, that's setting you apart from uh, your audience. Mm -hmm. Now, if so, uh, actually, I, I can give an answer to this because uh, my colleague Emma Rand teaches computing and biology and the students are struck by the fact that, that she is in incredibly 
proficient and knowledgeable she's she's a leader in the field and they don't expect uh, that because of her gender so uh, she's kind of uh, flipping the message there um, mm -hmm. so I, I suspect that uh, using what would be considered perhaps a, a, a geeky um, a piece of software for someone uh, from a, um, a marginalized group in computing might actually send the contrary message. So yes, I, I think that's the answer. Okay, we, uh, so um, Paula did have a, uh, um, a follow up to that, which maybe you can address, but um, Clemens also asks, um, where do you see language barriers coming in given that English is a language of science now and not everyone is a native speaker? Uh, so the, this ties to decolonization, this ties uh, uh, into a host of problems. So, uh, for example, in, in climate, uh, well, actually in science in general, we, we have regional journals and we have international journals. And the European and American regional journals have become the international journals. So if you're outside Europe or, or the EU, then a lot of your work will go into the regional journals that, 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 that um, we will typically never read or see. So um, that's a part of it. Language contributes to that. Uh, is there an effect that, that keywords in computer languages are typically in English? Um, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I've seen anything about that, but it's probably an effect. So I think those are all the Q&A questions. Um, I don't know if there are any other Slack questions that came up in the meantime. I think there's a question from Felicity. Um, great presentation, thanks. Are there any actions we could all take back to our institutions or any particular good publications that we can use to help convince people to change and saying that a public recording of this talk would be amazing? Uh, well, it will go on YouTube. Um, so uh, the Royal Society, belonging report, uh, Royal Society of Chemistry Belonging Report came out um, uh, a few months ago. Uh, that's a very good resource. Uh, and there is a, um, a forum that went with it and the video lectures there. I'm not sure if those are going on YouTube. If they are, they are fantastic. Um, uh, we've mentioned our ladies and our forwards. Um, uh, I suggest if you're trying to recruit someone, even if you're not looking for someone uh, with an R background, then then reach out to those groups as well. Um, uh, I had another resource, uh, but it slipped my mind now, I'm afraid. Okay, maybe one last quick question before um, we move on to the next talk. So, Joanna Skalidis asks, um, can you elaborate a bit more on how you would suggest integrating our research in a di diversity inclusion topic? Uh, so, um, uh, the, 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 the um, poster of Nobel Prizes is actually, and, and the following slide, those are both uh, slides from my um, crystallography, my diffraction course. So, you can Looking at the history of science, when you're teaching science, uh, you can almost always find examples. Um, when it comes to your research, uh, then uh, looking for examples of material from regional journals and highlighting those rather than falling back on the ones um, we typically uh, use uh, can be important, uh, can be useful. And if you start to spot a pattern there, so for example, we, we, we spotted a pattern, um, uh, which is, wasn't so much diversity related, but uh, between which country people are from and which refinement software they use. So that as soon as you start finding patterns, you can start asking what are the social factors that are driving this? And thank you so much, Kevin. That's been really, really informative. And um, I think Peter will introduce the next speaker.